So I remember it uh, so clearly. I don't know how many years ago it was, but it's been a bunch. It was a Sunday evening, and uh, just like we were a moment ago, we were uh, standing in the song before the lesson, and, and as I often do, I was uh, praying a bit before I got up to preach, and there was a little boy near the front row uh, that noticed that I had my eyes closed during the song, and so after, after the service, he came up to me and he said, I noticed your eyes were closed right before the sermon, during the song. What was, why was that? And I told him that I was asking God to help me give a good sermon. And, and Ryan said, why didn't he? <laughs> So little eyes <laughs> and honesty. But I felt like I needed to pray extra this morning because, doggone it, Todd, you already preached the best message this morning. That's so often the case. The guys do such a great job who lead us at the table. Thank you, Todd, this morning. But all the, the men that they really take uh, time to think through what they're going to say and have something fresh and meaningful for us. It's such a blessing. And uh, I remember, I think it was Lincoln that was credited with, with saying that it's much more difficult to, to put together a good short talk than it is a decent longer talk. I think he was right about that. And so they're really accomplishing something in those few minutes and, uh, and helped me worship this morning. So heard a reference on the news recently to some notorious prisoners that I hadn't thought about in, in quite a while, and I'm referring to the 9-11 terrorists that are held down in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. It's hard to believe, you know, they've been there now more than 20 years, and they've always been described by our government as the worst of the worst, as violent men, uh, terrorists, of course, bent on doing more damage if they ever had the opportunity. There's been talk for years about what to do about these men, the disposition of their cases, what to do about the facility down there, and, and so on. Should they have a trial in a U.S. court, or, or should they be transferred to a U.S. prison, that kind of thing? Not surprising, there's never been a, a state in the Union uh, that has said, sure, bring them here, or anything like that. I doubt that we would want to do that. These are men of notorious, violent reputation. Well, that's a pretty good description of a man that we read about in the New Testament. Uh, and the way he was described, a man whose story is mentioned in all four Gospels. It's pretty rare for uh, an individual story to be told by all four Gospel writers, but the story of Barabbas is. In, in Mark's Gospel, Barabbas is called a rebel who had committed murder in the rebellion. Luke, in, in his record, says something very similar to that. John refers to him as a robber. I want to take a moment today and, and just have us listen to what Matthew said about him. This is in Matthew chapter 27, beginning at verse 15. We'll read down through verse 26. Let's hear God's word here. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had a, a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas? or Jesus, who is called Christ. For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. 
Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to, said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. So Matthew describes this Barabbas as a notorious prisoner. He was a bad guy, through and through. He was dishonest, he was violent, he had stolen things, he had murdered, he had taken up arms against the government. So Barabbas would fit in well at any supermax prison facility. That's the kind of place that, that he would belong. But he found himself instead in the first century in a prison, probably a small cell, kept by the governor whose name was Pilate. And he was waiting his own death, most likely by crucifixion for his crimes. Before we go any further, I want to make sure that we don't misread this story. I, I think it's so easy to do, and I think I've done it often in my life. I've always looked at Barabbas as a bad guy. Uh, someone that I had nothing in common with whatsoever, who, because of monumental injustice, got off really easy because you know he was released and and my Jesus went to the cross instead. Friends, I, I think that's the wrong way to look at Barabbas. Even though there is indeed some truth in that. I believe God, through the gospel writers, intends us to see something else in Barabbas. In fact, I think God wants me to see me. And you to see you in Barabbas. Now, I know that the, the game of moral equivalence is so easy to play. You know that game, we, we tend to do it all the time in our minds. We say something like, oh, I know I'm not perfect. I've made my mistakes, but I'm not as bad as whoever, right? We're not as bad as those Disgusting terrorists down in Cuba. We're surely not as notorious as Barabbas. And it's largely true as long as the measuring stick is a terrorist or a murderer or a child abuser or a dictator or really any other human being that we feel superior to. As long as we humans compare ourselves with one another, 
we tend to always come out on top. But if we change the comparison, if we switch the yardstick, and we compare ourselves instead to God, to Jesus, then it all changes. Suddenly, the comparison makes me a lot less comfortable. When I am measured by the holiness of God, the difference between you and me and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed gets lost in the rounding. I believe that when we read about Barabbas, we are supposed to see ourselves. He is me. And he is you. Because the comparison is not me and you, but Jesus. It's, it's not me and you standing up there beside Pilate. It is the spotless lamb of God, Jesus the Messiah. And it's not just Barabbas in that prison cell awaiting his death on a cross for his crimes. It's me and you in that cell. This changes the way you read this story. See, Barabbas is every person. And his name almost lends itself to this idea, Barabbas. I bet you can figure out what that name means. You might remember another New Testament character who was introduced as uh, Bar-Jonah. Remember Simon Bar-Jonah? You remember what Bar-Jonah means? It means son of Jonah or John. Bar in Barabbas means son of. And then Abbas, the second part of his name. You're familiar with that as well. You remember when Jesus is in the garden praying in the garden of Gethsemane and he, he prays Abba, Father. What does Abba mean? It means father, dad. The name Barabbas means son of of the Father. So it's a pretty generic name, isn't it? Son of the Father. Isn't it interesting that, that this Barabbas, this Son of the Father, would be so closely associated with Jesus, whose claim to be the Son of the Father would get him nailed to a cross? A cross originally and rightfully intended for Barabbas. Now we have a lot to learn from Barabbas. And indeed, we may not want to hear it all. But we have a lot to learn. Older commentator on scripture named Donald Gray Barnhouse, in his commentary on the book of Romans, wrote the following, I wanted you to hear this morning. He said, we are all of Adam's race. We have been bound over for sedition against God. We are robbers of God's glory. We are murderers of our own souls and the souls of others. We find ourselves bound in the dark prison of sin. We feel in our hearts that we merit the sentence that has been announced to us, and we wait in trembling for the time of judgment. That's me. And Barabbas. And you. Yes, I have been a thief and a robber and a man of violence in all those ways that Barnhouse mentioned in his comments. I was justly sentenced 
to death for my sin. For the wages of sin is death. I was in a prison of my own making. I was awaiting punishment. I was a rebel against God. Do you have the wherewithal this morning to admit the same thing about yourself? Have you come to the realization that the man hanging on the cross is not the one who should have been hanging on the cross? That is an innocent man hanging there. Anyone else but him Anyone else but Jesus should be there on that cross. We have much in common with Barabbas. I want you to imagine with me for a moment what must it have been like sitting in that dark prison cell in Jerusalem the first century, hearing your name chanted in all the commotion outside in the courtyard, Barabbas, Barabbas, not knowing what's going on, but hearing your name chanted, and then hearing these words shouted even more forcefully, crucify him, crucify him. What must he have thought was going to happen? What must it have been like to see the soldier coming to his cell, opening it up, and taking him out to the light of day, and then unleasing his bonds, untying his chains and setting him free, not leading him outside, the city walls, to the place of the skull, but setting him free. What must it have been like? No, you see, the innocent man, they placed chains on. He it was that they led away. He was the one that gets beat up and and bruised and spat upon and scourged without mercy. He is the one who gets drugged outside the city to that horrible hill, to that place of death. What must it have been like to be Barabbas? If you're a Christian today, you ought to be able to answer that question. in some detail, because at one time, in a very real sense, you were Barabbas. You were the guilty one on death row who watched the innocent one take your place on the cross. You were set free from your bonds when you were baptized into his death. You became, like Barabbas, a child of the Father because of Jesus. You ought to know what it's like to be Barabbas. If you're not a Christian today, I sure hope and pray that you will consider Barabbas. Consider where you are in relation to Jesus today. You see, Barabbas had a choice when his prison cell doors swung open that day and the good news was announced to him that he could walk out of that prison without chains, that he could be free, that he was released from his sentence He had a choice. 
he could have rejected the pardon. He could have stayed in the cell. He could have died. Now that seems ridiculous to us, doesn't it? That he would even consider that option. Who would turn down the offer of freedom, of life? And yet, how many people, week after week, year after year, tell the prison guard, I'm just going to stay right here, thank you very much. I choose to stay in my prison, in my sin, in my guilt, in my shame. I will take my sentence. Jesus has gone to the cross. So not a single one of us here this morning ever have to. If you're a Christian today, that memory ought to inspire you to greater worship and greater service of the King. But if you don't yet belong to Jesus, man, it ought to make you leap out of that cell and give your life to the Lord. Today, today is the offer is made, today is the day of salvation. And this morning, the offer has been made to you. How will you answer? While together we stand and we sing.